Mashi Lawrence McElroy here for Water Tiger School and our weekly Facebook Live gig. Here, of course, for everyone in this continued time of being home alone together, because we're in this together. Um, but established because in the past we've had a public class at Sage and Public Library in Holbrook, New York, on Long Island which of course has been, well, at this point, I guess we could say canceled. Um, so until such a time as the program, you know, the re library returns and the uh, program, uh, let me start that again, the library opens and uh, the program returns, we'll be here on Monday mornings at 10 a.m. for little workshops. Um, so a word about the library. I just happened to, to um, think this morning that I should check where things are with them. And by the way, I'm, I'm testing, I'm not testing, we're, I, I've done the test and it seemed to work. I have a new uh, microphone I'm using. I had some sound issues with the integrated mic of the laptop um, last week after uh, a driver update. Yay, technology. So, uh, good morning, Colette. Um, so, I, it, the test actually ended up, it was a good purchase regardless of where I am with the integrated mic because it seems to pick up better than the integrated mic does. So I hope it serves us well. Uh, so, but anyway, I happened to, to uh, check in on the library on Sachin Public Library's website this morning and one of the banner heads looked something like this. Um, and they're doing a phase reopening just like New York State Forward. Um, and they've done phase one, which started June 4th, and that was material returns accepted, but outdoor drops only, because they were letting people hold on to stuff. And then phase two started last Wednesday, the 17th, curbside pickup available Monday through Friday, 9.30 to 4.30. So I guess, you, you know, you need to check with the library, um, but I'm assuming if you want materials from the library, you give them a call, drop them an email, and I will tell you, um when to stop by uh, to pick that up. Phase three, date to be announced. Uh, doors open with limited services provided under social distancing rules. Again, that's date to be announced. I'm talking about the library here. I'm not talking about New York State Forward. Phase four, date to be announced. Uh, limited program offerings resume under social distancing rules. So, you know, a little, another sign of a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, Water Tiger School has our own light at the end of the tunnel. We are planning on uh, if phase four of New York State Forward moves ahead on schedule uh, of reopening the studio for physical in-person classes uh, on Thursday, July 9th. Uh, but we are not a library, so. Um, you know, we have a little bit more flexibility in when we can open and that sort of thing. So um, that's only if everything stays in place. Everyone continues physical distancing, everybody continues raising their masks, and we keep the numbers low uh, in Suffolk County on Long Island. So anyway, so there's that. A little bit of news, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So today, um, what I'd like to do, a little warm-up. I'm using the word little a lot. I don't have any little idea why I'm using little a lot. Um, but anyway, a little warm up from, and there I did it again, uh, from our set that we call Water Tiger School, Awakening the Chi. Uh, we, did a tap, we did tapping a couple weeks ago, which is from this set. Uh, we're going to do Opening the Heart, uh, which I really enjoy a lot. Um, I hope you will too. And then spend some time with a walking exercise that many of you probably have not done before with the Tai Chi walk, the cat walk, the mountain climbing walk, however you want to refer to it. Um, but anyway, so we'll walk you into that slowly uh, to give you a, an opportunity to play with that. So that's what's on the agenda today. I want to talk about a couple other things while we wait for people to join us. Um, I'm looking to see if I can see a head count here, but I don't, so I'm never sure where to look for that. Um, but anyway, a couple of things. I, you know, I, I'm slowly making my way through my entire t-shirt collection, doing my best not to double up on t-shirts yet. And that says something that aside from maybe some crossovers between the YouTube channel 
and the Facebook Live sessions. Um, I haven't worn the same t-shirt twice in any of these sessions since March 23rd. I have a lot of t-shirts. Um, but I wanted to point out this one. I have, have had three t-shirts in the past. This is one of them. Uh, that feature white tigers, and it almost pains me these days to wear them. So since there's a white, t the white tiger on this t-shirt, I need to talk about white tigers for a moment. They are not albino tigers. They are not their own species. They are created by us. And that usually involves, well, doesn't usually involve, it has to involve uh, fathers, grandfathers, being bred with daughters and granddaughters to keep the recessive color gene that they need to keep out to make white tigers prominent. Because of this inner family breeding, forced breeding, many white tiger cubs are born with birth defects. Uh, those that do make it through birth without serious defects, life-threatening defects, that either make them have to be euthanized or they simply expire on their own. Adult white, white tigers are susceptible to all sorts of illnesses, medical ailments, all sorts of things. They live, it's, it's not a pleasant life. So though I do believe white tigers are very, very beautiful, they are not something that we should seek out. Um, you know, sort of in the same way as I would love, I would love to pet a tiger, but I never will. I, even if there's a tiger petting zoo somewhere, I will not because that's exploitation of the animal and they are treated very poorly in those situations. Um, plus, they're a wild animal. No human wildcat uh, contact. So anyway, there's my little speech about um, white tigers. If that was sort of a downer to start with, always throw out a joke when I share something that seems to take, you know, the emotional cue down. So here's a question. Don't worry, I'll give you the answer. Why did the tiger lose at poker? Because he was playing a cheetah. All right. Um, so I have one other thing, but I'll do it at the end. Um, so we'll get up, we'll do a little warm up. Like I said, it's from Awakening the Chi, uh, originally called by, you know, the person from whom I stole this, a Qigong warm-up, but we treat it as a Qigong uh, exercise set. So, open, let's just start with a shake, just cause. Everybody who knows me knows that I love, I love the shake. Just the shake. Maybe we'll just do this for 20 minutes and call it a morning. I know I threaten that all the time. I never do, except when I'm working out on my own. <clears throat> somebody else come in and say hi, or is that? Yep, okay. It's just somebody laughing at my joke, I think. Um, so anyway, opening the heart. Feet are going to be shoulder wide and parallel. When I instruct in this for people who uh, may be doing it for the first time, I'm just going to adjust something here. Um, I refer to it as a child on the swing exercise because what this does is it takes us and it makes us the swing set in many different ways. Our body, our legs are sort of the frame of the swing set. Our shoulders to hands are the ropes or the chains hanging off the top bar of the swing set. The palms are turned back. And we want to activate the arms enough so that we can pass our hips. Now we have a magical swing set. We are a magical structure of the swing set because the seat is attached between the hands and it's going to pass through the body as is the child who is on them. Now I want to point out that as we do this exercise, this isn't like a Fisher, uh, Fisher Price kind of swing set. In other words, I don't and then pump the arms. We let gravity and momentum take care of the movement. So if you are ever in a, a playground, have the opportunity. 
either yourself swinging, watch somebody swinging, or swing a, a child, grandchild, niece, nephew, that sort of thing. When we can do that sort of thing. Uh, just note that all you do, you know, they, they sit down and say, push me. You give them a push, and so sort of the momentum of the swing forward becomes the momentum of the swing back. So, boom. And we actually have an advantage as being human beings and swinging our arms like this, because we have, we'll have much more of a bend of the arm than the links of a chain or the braids of a rope. We drop down, and as we swing back, and the arms straighten, not to the point of locking off, that creates tension so the elbows are still relaxed. This physical makeup of our bodies, there's a physical compression in the muscles, the joints, and the tendons of the shoulders and upper back. So you're like compressing a spring, and then the spring pushes the hands forward. So you have the weight of the arms falling down in front. You have the compression spring in back. And the movement sort of take care of, it takes care of itself. Now notice, I am relaxed, but I'm not letting the hips swing in different directions, because that's not what we want. I'm keeping the upper body connected to the lower body. And in doing so, this pressure back and the lift up will lift the heels. The arms are properly dropped, the elbows properly weighted. There won't be any desire for anything to rise when the hands swing forward. So that, in a nutshell, is opening the heart. Why don't we call it the child in the swing exercise? Why do we call it opening the heart? Because this pumping action that I'm doing here, I'll just say facing you, is activating chi in the heart meridian in the torso. So you're cultivating heart energy in the body in forms of qigong work or qigong or energy work. So we're going to turn the palms back. Oh, and by the way, you know, sometimes, you know, we just sort of, you know, eventually some of us, because of, you know, too much relaxation, too much tension, will start to feel, you know, a sliding down of the momentum, just like a kid on the swing you know, that'll happen if they don't really help provide the swing with, you know, their relaxation and, and part of them still swinging forward as part of them starts to fall back, etc. And they'll say, hey, give me another push, I'm losing my momentum, and you give them another push. So that's all you do. If you start to lose the momentum of the swing forward and back, you just give the kid another push, and you're off to the races again for a while. So opening the heart from Wander Tiger School's awakening the chi. Kid sets down, you give him a push, and here we go. It's a weird paradox, like most of the things that we do, it's, there's some paradoxical aspects of it. And this is, I'm relaxed, but I'm letting, I'm allowing the shoulders, the hips, and the ankles to more or less stay in alignment. I'm not allowing the spine to roll forward and back, and the hips to swing forward and back. I'm keeping that structure of the frame of the swing set. I had a student a while back in the studio point out that when we were doing this exercise one night as a warm-up, she had a very strong childhood memory of actually swinging on a swing set that, let's just say, the posts of the frame weren't very well secured into the ground and as you swung, the posts would come up out of the ground a little bit. I remember that happening too when I was a kid, but I, didn't, I don't have that strong a memory of it. Backyard swing sets, not playground swing sets, if you're doing that. I also remember being pretty stupid. I think it was junior high. We'd go out to the elementary school playground for our junior high recess, and we'd swing on the swing set, we'd get as high as we could and then jump as we swung forward. Yeah, I don't know how I lived through middle, middle school, or uh, junior high, that was junior high, not middle school. <clears throat> Breathing, relaxing and releasing. There's not a set number of repetitions, though you can make it so. When I, I teach this set, I talk about, you know, maybe counting repetitions, but I can't count and talk at the same time, so usually I have a timer set, and I didn't do that, so I'm just letting it go for a while. And so one of the differences between 
the regular set and this set, is <clears throat> the names, right? I mentioned Linda Madero, from whom I stole this, called this set of Qigong Warma. And I believe this was swinging arms and raising heels. And I tell people that the heels don't have to come up off the ground. You're fine if you just, you're not relaxed enough for the heels to come up off the ground. For their merit not to be a heel rise, I had to force them to stay down there. But I'm relaxed enough that the heels will pop up when the arms swing back. Another difference between the original set and this is that she would let it go for a while and then just stop and move on to the next exercise. We fade. So that natural, sort of normal, organic fade I talked about as a possibility here, right? And if that's happening during the set, you give the kid another push and you're off to the races again. We want to instigate that or allow it to happen if it does happen. And every swing, after one is a little bit less, every subsequent swing, like dominoes falling, will be a little bit less and a little bit less. And pretty soon, there's not enough momentum in the arms and the hands to bring the heel up off the ground. And we don't force the swing to end. We don't force the swing to continue. But the momentum should slowly come to a stop all on its own. And then you feel what there is to feel. Right? I feel tingling in my fingers because of that centrifugal force of the swing, so blood and chi. But I also do feel within the pathway that is the heart meridian in the chest. I feel something going on. You may feel either of those, you may feel neither of those, and both of those things are okay. But that's opening the heart. I like it because of you know, the, the pump, pumping motion. It's a good warm-up in, in the upper body because the legs are involved just in you know, stability-wise and maybe the pumping action of the heels. It sort of gets the lower body going as well. So there you go, in a nutshell. Awakening the cheese, opening the heart. Um, so one of the first things we did all the way back to March 23rd was explore our, our rails exercise. Now, most of the time in the public classes, when Water Tiger presents uh, walking the rails, we just do walking the rails. You know, we have our feet parallel, shoulder wide. We've introduced vertical alignment, crown point of the head, base of the pelvic bowl ball of the foot, we take the step, leading with the heel, and slide from side to side, working on maintaining that idea of four things, right? Spine hanging like a string of pearls in movement. Feet parallel, the relationship of the feet to the ground in movement. Maintaining shoulder width in movement and governing the step so we don't fall into the step, which of course, since we're walking, is in movement, but you want that governance of the step. So primarily, that's what we do in the public classes. We don't do rails with rotation, which we have a whole family of rails with rotation that, that Water Tiger will, will present in our studio program that we don't normally do in our public classes. But on March 23rd, and by the way, that video, that live video, which is av available in the live catalog here on Water Tiger School's Facebook page, is now also on our YouTube channel. We're doing that now instead of coming up with original content, though we did produce some original content last Thursday about the breath. Um, we'd initially tag that as something to do in one of these live sessions and decided that it made more sense to do that as a YouTube uh, video. So last week we had both um, a repost of our very first Facebook live session ever, well, sort of ever, um, on March 23rd. We posted that on Monday, uploaded that on Monday, and then we uploaded the About the Breath video uh, on Thursday. And uh, it, it, it's, it's worth a listen. So anyway, rotation, you have a ball about the size of your torso and you can see I'm shifting back and forth and when I shift to the right the right hand goes to the top of the ball and when I shift to the left the left hand goes to the top of the ball so what we do is we put that what we refer to as a single rotation 
is really only a half rotation because the hands are only changing places back and forth. We call that a full rotation. Left when the left foot has the weight, right when the right foot has the weight. And we put that into our rails exercise. So we step, and as the left foot fills, the left hand goes to the top of the ball. Right foot comes in, goes back out. Or it can float, doesn't really matter. You know, there are challenges in both. I still want to do the hokey pokey step there. I do two more steps. I'm going to end up cutting off my head, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Now I'm going to do two more steps. And then last step. An old casual closing. Use the casual closing always to explore movements through the whole body. So if something happens upstairs, something happens downstairs. So that's rails with rotations. <clears throat> One of these workshops we did, uh, you know, we've done Tai Chi walk. We've also done Tai Chi flying, which takes the Tai Chi walk or the mountain climbing walk or the cat walk or the five count walk and puts it in the context of a movement like this. What we're going to do this morning is introduce how you can do a ball rotation with our five count Tai Chi walk. So to play into that, we need to once again define what our Tai Chi stance and what our walk is about. So just like in rails, we have our shoulder width. Shoulder width, by the way, defined by where the drop of the shoulder is, cuts the heel on that side in half. So this point right here, not anywhere on top, on the trapezius muscle, the glute ferrigno muscle, not on the flat of the shoulder, not out on the outside of the delt, but right at that initial descent, cuts that heel in half, and it's the same on this side. And that's our shoulder width, and shoulder width is always determined by where the heels are. So if I turn on the balls of the feet and turn my heels in, though the balls of my feet are still where they were at my shoulder width, I am not shoulder wide because my heels are too close together. If, however, I turn my toes out by turning on the heels, I am still shoulder wide. And the same is true if I turn both my set ball, balls of the feet, both the toes pointing into the center line. If my heels are still where they were, I'm still shoulder wide. So shoulder width is determined by where the heels are. So those are my railroad tracks. I'm going to, since we always tend to start <clears throat> with the weight in the right foot first, I'm going to turn the right foot out to around a 45. Lawrence says around a 45 because a 45 is ideal, but sometimes we may have to be inside a 45. Sometimes, as a matter of fact, we may have to be outside a 45. But most people find 45 or inside the place to be. Uh, and again, 45 is ideal. And notice I got there by turning on the heel, not the ball of the foot. Boom, and I put enough weight in that foot, step the left foot forward, but see, I have my railroad track, and where I picked up that foot, I was on the railroad track, and where I sat it down, set it down, I'm on the same railroad track. So I didn't bring the foot any closer to alignment with my back foot, I moved it forward on its railroad track. So I'm not too far forward here. Right? I've only got a little bit of distance forward between the feet, but I have my width. Front toes forward. They can be in. I can have the feet sort of pointing to the same direction and my knees will be okay. I don't wanna be forward in this and have the toes out. Though as we walk, there comes a moment when the toes are out. But that's not this moment. It's a different moment. The weight distribution and the move, the physical structure of the body is different in the movement than it is right here. That protects the knee. Being in this position and having the toes forward, I don't know if you can see this or not. My toes are pointed out that way. And because I'm moving forward then and turning the hip back, my knee is still pointing forward and I'm putting shearing pressure on that knee that the knee won't like. <laughs> I need to let go of that, right? The other thing to keep in mind, I'll go profile here. Knee over ankle, safest. Knee over the top of the foot's okay. 
Once again, I'm going to create a little bit of stress on my knee just to demonstrate what not to do because a little bit of stress here for a couple of seconds is a lot of stress built up over time. So you wanna make sure over ankle, if you're really, really concerned about your knee, over top of the foot should be fine for most people. Very important for the knee. Right? So that's our four stance. We square off the hips. When we are in four stance, forward moving stance, we should have about 60, 70% of the weight on the front foot, 30, 40 on the back foot, back heel is down. When you come forward, don't pick up that back heel, keep that back heel down. Also, the outside of the instep should be down. Sometimes we roll to the inside of the instep. We wanna make sure the outside of that foot is down. So my hips are square, my shoulders square, chest is sunk, back is rounded, chin from parallel, slight tuck down. Now, when I rock back, the direction from whence I came, when I take a step, I wanna make sure that this back knee stays in the same orientation of the back foot. So I'm not keeping the leg the same length and pushing the knee sideways. Knees aren't made to go sideways. Remember the wisdom of Dalton, give me the biggest guy in the world, you take out his knee, he'll drop like a stone, right? And that's hitting the knee, kicking the knee, striking the knee sideways, boom. So I'm setting down into that back leg, but my knee is still pointed the same direction as my back toes. Now, if I rock forward, boom, setting down into that leg, hip, making sure that the toes land forward. That's important. So if I rock back and bring the ball of the foot with me, so now my toes are, my both sets of toes are pointed the same direction. When I turn forward to fill that foot, I make sure the toes in forward. And in all reality, you've just done one, two, and three, in our five count walk to get from one side to the other. So the walk itself then becomes, here I am, vertically aligned, crown point of the head, base of the pelvic bowl, ball of the right foot. I step, reaching my shoulder width with the heel of the left foot. That's one. Two is the turn forward and setting the weight, more weight in the front foot than the back foot. So there I am in my four stance, about 70, 30, can be 60, 40, can be 80, 20. If you go much higher than 80 or much lower than 60, it's too much in either direction. Just right, just enough. Find, find the Goldilocks principle there. Three is the rock back, releasing the ball of the foot. Here's the really tricky part in the five count Tai Chi walk. Because I wanna open up this hip. So there's sort of a turn but it's more of an opening. But sometimes when I open up this hip, I'll bring the other hip with me. And if I do that, once again, I'm moving the knee sideways. So I wanna make sure that on four, that knee stays where it is. I open up the left hip in this instance, and I point my left toes out to about a 45. This is the moment I was talking about, right? Here, forward. Here is fine at the 45. And what we're gonna do, moving into five, Release the back heel when you have to, to maintain your vertical alignment, to keep pressure off of both knees. And you come in. And again, on one, now the right foot is reaching for its railroad track. Two, right toes are ending forward, knee over ankle, knee over top of foot, hip square, shoulder square. Three, rock back, release. See, the ball of the foot comes up off the ground. One, because it wants to. Right? Because I'm shifting the weight back, the ball of the foot wants to follow. And that's fine because I am bringing the weight back into this leg. I am bringing the emphasis back into this leg. Four, here's that pivot. Now the right hip is going to open up. And in all reality, the left hip, both sides of the pelvic bowl, have to open like pages of a book to keep that left knee in the, right, in the correct position. That's four. Five is coming up. So hips, shoulders, this angle, belly button, knee, toes, nose, this angle, I'm making an X. From that X, one, two, now we have a plus sign. Hips and shoulders, this way, side to side, left and right, east and west, south and north, whatever. 
right? Belly button, nose, knee, toes, this direction. So I have a plus sign or a cross. So from the X marks the spot to a plus sign. By the way, turning forward, you may say, well, Lawrence, when we rock back, you see the ball of the foot wants to come up off the ground. So we let it. Well, when I turn forward and feel that foot, my heel wants to come up off the ground. Why can't I let it come up? The reason your heel wants to come up off the ground is you don't have the intent to drive it down and backwards. And that intent is very important for grounding because if it wants to come up off the ground, that means too much of you is moving forward and you'll lose your root. But driving back and down keeps you stable. So two, three, rock back and release. Four, pivot. And five, come up. One, two, three, four, five. Going to take two more steps. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, no three, four, and five, only the casual closing. Knee pop is optional if you heard that. Hopefully you did with the new microphone. Um, so there's the basic five count walk. Now a couple of things. Some people will say that that's incorrect because once you start moving forward, you should only move forward. And I understand that. I just don't agree with it. Um, I can make the argument for it, but I'm not going to because I prefer my method. Basically, the reason they, you know, they say once you start moving forward, you should always move forward. That's how a river flows. That's how a stream flows. Yeah, okay, what happens if the water hits a rock? As much as we may want it to or imagine it just passing right through the rock, no. It backs up. A little bit because of the force of moving forward causes an opposite and equal reactions and then it finds the best path around the rock so it can continue to move forward so there's that there's also the fact that continually moving forward you have to do something called a twist up nobody 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 no no one attempted this as i'm demonstrating please if you don't already know what you're doing right a twist step is turning on the heel of the front foot while it is weighted in the ball of the back foot. So there's no five count. You step, you twist. You step, you twist. You step, you twist. You step. And again, I'm out of space. Right? So, as you might guess, pretty dangerous on the knees. Our method justified in flow of the water, and uh, let's not send anybody to the orthopedist. So there's the five count of the lower body. So that's one thing that I wanted to mention about our five count walk. Number two is the stance names, because I made reference, you know, I, I think maybe I did, maybe I didn't this morning. This is what I would call a left four stance. I call it a left four stance because I step to the left, I end in my four stance with the weight into my left foot. So it is, to me, a left stance. Other folks will call it a right four stance because to get there, my weight is initially in my right leg. So to them, where I start designates the name of the stance. I start with the weight in the right, so this is a right four stance. I start with the weight in the left, so this is a left four stance. But to us, because we end, we step to the right, we end our four stance with more weight in the right foot than the left. We are moving forward and into the right foot. To us, it's a right four stance. So just that designation, you know, your program, your instructor may something, say something different. I understand the first one perfectly. Yeah, where you start your journey. Because um, it's the journey, not the destination. A uh, little Taoism there. Um, but we do what we do. Same with always moving forward. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. River always flows forward. If there are no obstructions, 
it's always moving forward. And even if there are obstructions, water will find a way to continue moving forward. So you should move forward. Understand that, can justify that. I like my way better. So how do you rotate a ball doing a five count walk? Well, you have to five, find five aspects of the ball rotation to get you from here to here. So unlike rail, walking the rails with rotation, where it's just a single step, Uh-oh, I froze there for a moment. I hope, you, I, I hope I'm still moving for you guys. Right, you only have the single step. Well, you can still break down that step. One of the things that we do in the studio is add rotations. So two rotations would be begin the step and there's one rotation and end the step and it's two. So, or three rotations. Take the step as one, ground two, fill the foot three. And you can continue to build that way, but we only do three rotations in the studio. So what are the five rotations of the ball? Well, since five and, you know, into one, you know, one forming the ball, ideally it should be forming the ball as opposed to five and holding the ball. So maybe as you start this ball rotation exercise, one and five are the same thing. That's okay. Let's actually just say that. One and five for now, same thing. So holding the ball and step is one. Two, my hands right in front of me, ball size is still the same. So I've gone from here to a simple rotation of the ball between the palms there. Three, I'm going to rock back and release the foot. So I start to turn a little bit back in the direction from once I can. On the opening, four, I'm going to start going toward the other side. And as I start to come up, here's five, and for now, five becomes one. One becomes two. Two becomes three. Again, I'm from here, parallel to the ground, more or less, somewhere around abdominal height. Palm to palm, Lao Gong point to Lao Gong point. I just realized I forgot to bring some things downstairs with me. So maybe I'll leave you by yourself for a moment and go get something, and then maybe again I will. Let me see if there's anything I can use close by here. Uh, it doesn't look like it. So again, I'm here, but I rock back in the direction from once I came. Since I'm going to fill the left foot a little bit more, I bring the left hand a little bit more to the top. I pivot, my emphasis starts to go to the right side. So the right hand starts to go to the top of the ball, left hand toward the bottom, and come in. So there's the ball, and there's the step one, two. Again, rocking back, starting to fill the right foot, right hand toward the top of the ball. Pivot over toward the left, left hand starts to come to the top of the ball. Four becomes five, and five becomes one. Two, three, four, five, one, two, starting to cut off my head here, three, four. This is actually a good thing, as I believe I've mentioned, a good image for us, just one and two. And I'm going to freeze for a moment before I close because now I have no head. I know it looks like my shoulders are lopsided, but that's just sort of the laptop and where I have it seated, seated, where I have it set, right? Because my shoulders right now are actually parallel to the earth. But my head is gone. That's the way it's supposed to be when we play. Nothing up here. Everything in here. A little casual close. So if... You'll, oh, I know what I, I could use the T. Eh, I don't want to use the T bottom. That's a little weird. So if you hold on for a moment, play for a little bit, uh, you know, shake, try a walk. I will be right back. I'm sorry for this, um, but you know, I had a, a, a Facebook Live fail uh, today, and I want to uh, I, I, I want to bring something into this that I forgot to bring down with me. So I'll be right back. Don't go away.
We're coming back. I don't think I'm coming. Don't go anywhere. Hello. Sorry about that. So I meant to bring a couple of things with me, but I want to at least introduce my friend. They call it a Tai Chi ruler but it doesn't like run a government or anything, so it's really a Tai Chi rule in my book. It's a little small for this particular task because I really prefer the ball to be the size of my torso. Well, the size of my torso is here. So it's the, really a good size for a Tai Chi rule, but not to completely exemplify the rotation, the, the kind of ball that I want in this rotation. But you notice, you know, more or less, that's a little artistic wooden dowel, right? So you can use anything. You can use like a uh, short broom handle. You can go to or, you know, order online uh, a dowel from uh, Lowe's, uh, cut it to the right length. You can find a pillow that's the right length. You could, you know, again, Maybe not the right size. I said, you know, I'm not going to use the tea bottle, but the tea bottle could work if it's solid. Yoga blocks really way, 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 way too small. But that might help establish, at least initially, that your palms are in alignment. You don't want to use a real ball because the real ball requires you to hold it out here. Right? Um, all I have small balls are um, weighted balls. So I have like a medium size, you can see it in the background, I think over here, maybe not. Yeah, you can. Nice medium stability ball, but I have to hold the ball out farther from my body because I not only have the reality that I want between my hands, I have a reality from front to back. And that creates a little bit of strain and stress on the shoulders that for this exercise, I really don't want. But something like a Tai Chi rule, or a dowel of some sort, or a firm pillow, all work pretty well. And notice, as we did the walk before, and I sort of emphasized, when the right leg is full or filling, that's when the right hand is moving toward the top of the bowl, and the left foot is full or filling, that's when the left hand starts to rotate top to the top of the bowl. This, again, is to practice that idea that even without something between my hands, my palms are always on alignment. They're not going all sorts of different funky directions. So one more pass this morning. We use the Tai Chi rule. And here we go. Let's smooth out five and one. Right now, we, you know, the first couple of times we've been talking about this, we talk about five and one and simply holding the ball. But what we want this to become is, you know, maybe even to start, bounce the weight into the left foot, start filling the right foot, start coming to the top of the ball, and by the time the right hand's to the top of the ball, the foot is down. So there's one. Here's two. Three, and the right hand's starting to go toward the top. Four, left hand starting to go to the top, still going to the top, still going to the top. Oh, it's there. So five is really forming the ball, not holding the ball. So four gets us to here, and five is journeying into the top, but by the time you get to the top, the top is really one with the step. Two, three, four, and again, five is the journey toward the top, so that by the time the hand gets to the top, the foot is down for one. Two, three, four, five, and one. Two, three, four, five, and one, two, and this is the last step. So a little close. And there you go. Five count Tai Chi walk, rotating the ball. So what you're doing there, you know, one, working on that sort of mimetic quality of Tai Chi. So creating something real between the hands that's not there. Usually when we're playing our forms on our floor exercises and actual postures, what we're creating with the have, with which the hands are in contact is our shadow opponent. 
So we started to build that idea of being able to foster that kind of imaginational creativity in your play. Two, upper body and lower body connection. So important. Something happens upstairs, something happens downstairs. You know, that's why we emphasize when we're doing a casual closing that it's not bringing the foot in, doing this, and bringing the hands to the belly. You actually want things through. The whole body is moving together as one. So it's another way of exploring upper body, lower body connection in movement, in our Tai Chi stance, in our Tai Chi walk. So there you go. I hope you had fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Um, I got one last thing I just want to mention, you know, cause we are still, I mean, yes, New York uh, forward is, you know, moving ahead. If Long Island stays on track, I think Wednesday, we move into um, phase three. So we're on schedule to enter into phase four of New York State uh, forward um, uh, the week after July 4th holiday. You're welcome, Colette. Um, and, you know, all that's good. But one of the ways to do that is to, you know, keep wearing your mask, please. I've been pleased. I go out very very inoffen, sometimes not even once in a whole week, um, unless it's really, really necessary. Um, but keep wearing your mask. Keep washing your hands. Um, welcome, Tess. Um, but maybe we're getting sick of happy birthday. Maybe we're getting sick. You know, in the early days, I did the uh, litany against fear. Uh, from Frank Herbert's Dune as one of the possible exchanges for the happy birthday song. Here's another one. So, you know, you start the water, you wet your hands, you get the soap. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity. It asked a crumb of me. Emily Dickinson, by the, t by the way, uh, if you want the text of that, uh, you can thumb back through both the Water Tiger School Facebook page and the Laoshi Lawrence McElroy Facebook page, and it's there or simply do a Google search for hope is the thing with feathers and you have something new. Plus, you tape a copy of that over your sink and you'll memorize a poem that you can have with you, always. Um, so thanks, we'll do something, I think probably completely different next week. Um, we've got a lot of things on cue. Uh, obviously we have to, because right now um, we know that that phase four reopening at Station Public Library, which is different than phase four for New York State Forward, uh, will not involve face-to-face uh, -face programs at least through August. Um, so um, we'll see you again. Well, you'll see me. I won't see you. So keep washing your hands. Keep wearing your mask. Stay safe. And um, take care of one another, please. So bye.